Hello, this is the Big Data and Society Bookcast, where we interview authors about important new work on big data and its implications for society. I'm Kaylin Narita, an assistant editor for the Big Data and Society Journal. Today I'm here with Dr. Melissa Via Nicholas, an associate professor for the Graduate School of Library and Information Studies at the University of Rhode Island. Dr. Via Nicholas's recent book, Data Borders, How Silicon Valley is Building an Industry Around Immigrants, unearths how private actors are profiting, expanding, and obscuring border practices in the U.S. This book is a topical and must-read to consider the technological backbone of the U.S.-Mexico border and how counter-data methods can help to reimagine a different borderland. Thank you so much, Melissa, for being here today. Thank you, Kaylin. To start off today, I was hoping that maybe you could tell me a little bit about where the idea for the book came from. Yeah, thanks so much for asking that and thanks for the invite. Um, So I had started to see reports in different media outlets and reports coming from um, immigrant rights groups that there was this sort of building data gathering around um, undocumented people in the US. So the Intercept and Immigrant Defense Project and Mehente all had these different reports coming out. And this was probably like, (laughs) you have to get the years right, but six or seven years ago um, that a lot of exposés were coming out on different sort of um, surveillance methods happening. And it was also at the time where people were just finding out in general how much surveillance was happening in the U.S. Um, Just day to day, there was something new. So as I was seeing those reports come out, I was I would follow up and look on the news. And at the same time, um, President Donald Trump at that time was taking bids from Silicon Valley companies um, to build new um, technology around immigrant data collection and along the U.S.-Mexico border. So I was seeing that, and then I would follow up and sort of look at their test projects and the videos on this different tech that they were piloting. Like, a lot of times it's drones, but I guess they have those little robotic dogs, all kinds of things. And it was looking really familiar because it was the U.S.-Mexico border, but it was also similar to my hometown in Riverside County, California. Um, So the terrain looked so familiar and the companies, everything just started to feel a little too close to home, like it was resonating so much. And so that's why I felt like I had to pursue that um, and see what, what was happening. Why is it so close. Um, even the tech company Anduril, you know, a lot of times those companies started in Northern California or Seattle, then they sort of move out from there. But Anduril is based in um, Orange County or Long Beach, I believe. So they are even based out of Southern California, um, just like a lot of defense companies, you know, like Boeing or Lockheed Martin. So it just started to feel so, resonate so much, whereas I think in the past, like the Silicon Valley companies, it's like, okay, there they are up in San Francisco or Seattle, but it's, and they had since moved also down to um, LA, but it was starting to like, their pilot projects were looking, the terrain was looking so similar to my hometown. So it felt like I should pursue this because it was feeling familiar. Yeah, yeah. So almost like the borders of Silicon Valley were expanding and we're seeing yeah. these different like things emerge at the border, but also in California. And yes. as a California native myself, I, I really, that really spoke to me as well. And I think one of the things, obviously you're from the library science discipline and you deploy a lot of different methods in the books. I was hoping that you could maybe go into and describe some of the methods that you uh, developed in the book and also maybe as well like as I was saying this kind of personal using personal stories why that was really crucial for um, for something to include in the book. Yeah yeah thanks for asking that. Um, I was I started off the project by thinking like I'm gonna FOIA Freedom of Information Act all these places I'm gonna have this like expose just like we were seeing in the intercept or these Mm -hmm. like immigrant rights groups exposes and 
as I was just like trying to collect data on the whole thing, you know, and think of it as like a content analysis of what was going on, I was realizing like one, it was changing every day. Like there was a new something every day. Mm -hmm. And so trying to like gather it all up and say, this is the thing <laughs> that we're seeing here. Yeah. It was just impossible. I did Googling Clearview, um, the com tech company that has like more facial recognition scans than the FBI. Like if I Googled them every day, I'd be like, there's a new thing, like a new lawsuit or something new was found out. So <laughs> I was like, I can't actually gather it all up and describe what's going on because it's constantly shifting and we're learning something new every day. It's so big. So, and I was talking to Sarah Lambden who wrote this wonderful book, um, Data Cartels, mm -hmm. and she was sort of writing that at the same time. So we were talking and she's like, and she had read over some of my work and she's like, remember that like describing the thing isn't like, we have to do something beyond describing it. So I kept having to hone back into like, it has to go beyond the like expose or the necessarily content analysis into to something else. And so as I was mm -hmm. also resonating with my personal experience, I'm second generation Mexican American. I grew up in Southern California, close to the US Mexico border. I grew up seeing border patrol pretty regularly and seeing my mom questioned by border patrol and knowing people that were deported. It's just part of our everyday lives. And I talked mm -hmm. to other people from like Arizona and Texas, New Mexico, who were like, yeah, that is part of our everyday lives. But I started to think like I needed to anchor this more into a method that was more qualitative and autoethnographic um, mm -hmm. because these journalists and immigrant rights groups were doing the work of like describing the thing, pulling out what was happening and sort of exposing what these companies are doing. And I wanted to help name that um, through autoethnography, through my experience growing up close to the border and um, in immigrant communities, and then also by interviewing undocumented people from my hometown and surrounding areas. Um, and the, I had a really great like anonymous reviewer also who was like, the strength is in the, you know, the interviews and the qualitative stuff and the reflection. So I kept trying to anchor back to that while also having to sort of describe what was going on, but knowing that like with it, even if I look up the mission of Palantir or the mission of, and the mission statement of Andro, mission statement of Palantir, any of these Silicon Valley tech companies, it would change like the next day. I would be like, I just wrote about that. And they changed that again. <laughs> like it was just, such a slippery thing, you know, and these companies will change names and merge and all that. So I was, tr I, it became more and more autoethnographic and um, qualitative to try to anchor into like people's experiences of their physical borderlands and try to name these data borderlands through like the physical anchoring of that. If yeah. that makes sense. I mean, I think I just felt like it was important because if I'm realizing Amazon is hosting ICE data and helping ICE, like I have a visceral knowledge of what that looks like, like what people, what it looks like when people are deported or what it feels like to know people that are deported. But like what my concern is that other folks can use these major tech conglomerates and not feel a visceral mm -hmm. reaction. So I wanted to keep anchoring into the visceral to pull that out. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. And I think one of the, going back to kind of this idea of the borderland, one of the main arguments that you really go into that I was hoping that we could speak a little bit more about is this idea of the data citizen Mailu. Yeah. So you think a lot about these and you historicize the surveillance practices at the US-Mexican border. So like, again, that these aren't emerging, that these are something that we see quite often, but maybe that people don't have that personal connection to. And I think may, like this idea that you build this argument that as technology is shifting away from this surveillance or surveilling the broad into surveilling and targeting bodies, 
with mm -hmm. also this dragonet kind of entrepreneurial spirit of Silicon Valley, you emerge with this theme of the military industrial startup complex. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what you think is new about these technologies. Mm -hmm. And maybe for listeners who don't know, maybe you focus a lot on Palantir and Andro. Yeah. And perhaps just thinking like, we know that there's always been surveillance at the border, but what is you know new about these technologies and what is really the threat? Yeah, I think what's new is um, one of the things that Mehente and the Immigrant Defense Project had, Immigrant Rights Defense Project had um, found was that it was really the access of the cloud that brought a lot of these companies out. Um, so having cloud storage is where you can really correlate data. And that's what emerged as new. And that also shifted deportation because folks were being targeted individually for deportation because they could be found um, through correlated data, data. So if they weren't necessarily found through like social security number or some other piece of identifying information, you know, a name, there would be a correlation and other ways to find folks. Um, so the correlation into each other, I think, is what really has grown um, all of this in scale. So Amazon Web Services um, tends to have the largest contract with USCIS um, in holding all of that data. And that's what I also say is sort of new. And that's why I kept trying to anchor back to my experience in um, Southern California, because now any of us as users of Amazon or LexisNexis or, you know, not just like Anderol, who is so specifically military um, targeted, but something as basic as our library databases, which for us in library information science is really alarming, they give access to ICE as well. Um, so I think what's new is just the intimacy that is suddenly data, um, that, that for library information studies, as an instructor, I have to teach like LexisNexis and Elsevier databases, um, and they hold contracts with ICE, so ICE can look at their data to look and find folks. Um, so I could be in Rhode Island, or I can be anywhere that is not necessarily anchored into the U.S.-Mexico border and still be a part of this ICE dragnet um, by teaching these databases, by, of course, you know, Amazon's kind of a low hanging one, but um, really sort of seemingly benevolent um, tech that we've really relied on in library and information studies, especially, and we can't, and we can't really like get, we can't boycott LexisNexis and Elsevier to an extent that, um, the extent that I think we'd like to, because, that's how we get patrons information in libraries. Mm -hmm. And that's what I teach my students how to do, you know? So it's really that, what I call intimacy, entering into like, I'm teaching my students how to build, you know, and my students are gonna go in and become librarians where ideally undocumented people wanna use the library and they feel safe there. But if we are using, certain tech products that have contracts with ICE, we can never ensure um, that level of like safe space. So there are just so many entrances, it's hard to describe, but I think it's the scale, the correlation and the intimacy um, of that in our lives. Yeah, and I think this idea of the opt-in, you can't opt out of these Silicon Valley technologies. Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, with such a tangential, like a tangible example of a library and, you know, these are resources that everyone needs to access. But as you say, like Amazon Web Services, how can you opt out of this service when, you know, your government data is being held in Amazon Web Services? And I think that really comes through in your book about this industry. And maybe if you could just speak a little bit about why how you kind of think about this industry as unique of Silicon Valley. So we think about like 
the scope of it but what did the contracts what did that kind of reveal in your research looking at these contracts yeah I mean what I thought was interesting was that and what I talk about is that like undocumented people and people cro physically crossing the U.S. Mexico border and people in the U.S. are kind of targeted as like the, the means to the end of building information technologies. So mm -hmm. along the U.S.-Mexico border, that's really like hardware and software and AI and all of these bids on how to catch a person. Um, the U.S.-Mexico mm -hmm. border has in particularly been like, has always been a challenge for Border Patrol and um, Department of Homeland Security because of the terrain. And so in the past, it's the tech that, different companies like Boeing had built weren't always up to identifying a person versus an animal versus um, shrubbery. There's just a lot going on in the U.S.-Mexico border. So these tech companies, it's proposed that they, they're they up for the challenge. <laughs> they're up mm -hmm. for all these different ways of narrowing in on identifying people versus other objects. And so there's so many different companies it's hard to choose one but um there's um so so Anduril is one of the bigger ones that has a lot of different proposals um they do use AI along the border they use old technology structures and gathering data and new structures as well um you know they can find someone with drones locate a person and then border patrol can come and get that person um so it's really this the infrastructure it's like it's kind of like a hype around catching a person mm -hmm. and that was my concern that i was seeing as well is um that suddenly undocumented people's data or their being is the product that they're trying to develop tech around and grab along the border but also trackable around um the u.s so i don't know if that answers yeah. your question but just to try yeah, yeah. to one example there's so many there's another company um that built that works with the tech for self-driving cars and they propose a 3d wall um where they can basically like build out a wall where they can see any of the data along the u.s mexico border and what i say in the book is like these products aren't separated. And what Sarah Lambden's found in data cartels, they're not separated out from what the company does in their other parts of the company. So mm -hmm. if they're using tech um, to build a 3D wall and it's the same tech that builds self-driving cars, like the, the data that they're gathering at the border is improving their tech for self-driving cars and the data they're grabbing, they're, um, grabbing for self-driving cars is improving the tech Along, you know, that's just how yeah. data works. It kind of feeds into improvement of those technologies. This so feedback have, loop, yeah. This yes, like yes, profiting exactly. feedback loop that is like a symbiotic relationship between yeah. immigration control enforcement and these private companies because they're yes. both profiting in different right. ways, all at the cost of undocumented persons. Right, exactly. Yeah. And that's my concern and when you see sort of Anduril media there's a lot of fandom around um, Anduril tech so it's like very um, high produced like expensive drones or different tech and folks will be talking about it on YouTube like do their sort of fandom breakdown and I think Anduril ideally also would like to have those products in the mm. store, you know, so there's a real intimacy again with being a consumer and um, data that's used for surveillance and deportation. Yeah. Well, something that I loved about this book is you kind of have one section of just maybe doom and gloom. These networks <laughs> are really dragging people in. It's causing a lot of um, pr producing exclusionary politics, you really think about these technologies and describe them. But I think ending the book with this counter data narrative and kind of, and this idea of a new borderland imaginary is really powerful. And I wanted to ask if you know how do you believe or do you believe that incorporating new imaginaries and this counter data 
could there be new productions at the border? And how would the, how would technology feed into this imaginary? I know you speak about this with your interviews, but I just think it's a really great way to end the book. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's like I couldn't I couldn't just end with the actual situation because it was <laughs> it is so dour. So, um, you know, I didn't when I talked to folks, I was starting with their story, their crossing story, because I really wanted to anchor into like this is their story. If they feel comfortable telling it, um, I believe that like their sort of empowerment comes from being able to tell their story of crossing over. Um, but a lot of the sort of, there is a lot of tech that's count, built to, counter to the surveillance tech. And I, people would talk about the ways they got through and I scrubbed a lot of the interviews because, um, so there is, I just want to say there is already like a lot of tech built to evade border patrol and evade mm -hmm. ICE. And there's just, and that's always been sort of the way it is. Like folks know how data is being gathered and they're, they're building things to come through. Um, so um, there's definitely, all kinds of tech that's sort of developed and counted to that. Um, I didn't want to like go into detail with that because I didn't want to build, you never know how much like new build information. Build more resistance. Yeah. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, so in the book I talk about techno imagined futures and we folks told me their story of crossing over and I tried to keep it in an original format. Um, and these folks were had been deported and they had been in detention centers and they had come back over and they had lived where my hometown is. And um, so first they told their story and then I asked them about like, how would you imagine the border? How would you imagine border patrol? How would you reimagine your city? Because I wanted to be in context and not like, now let's build a technology that will counter what's going on. like in information science, like in social justice sort of lines of thinking, we say that information always needs context. So mm -hmm. I was thinking, okay, if we're trying to ground ourselves in context here, like what about all along the way? And a lot of folks said they would just make border patrol more humane. You know, they didn't, they weren't even like fully radical, like down with all borders. They were like, we know that borders have to be there, but we would ask that border patrol is more humane. And I think they, from what I learned, like Border Patrol was seen sort of on par with with the coyotes that were um, exploitive, the folks mm. that crossed over that were exploitive or violent or cruel, like Border Patrol seemed to be talked about in the same way. So they wanted that to change. And then we just talked about our hometown and that was nice because it was just like, more parks or more programs, you know, for kids. And then we talked about what tech would you imagine if you could imagine anything. And two examples I give um, are one woman who I call Luce, um, we use pseudonyms, of course, and she said just a door that she could cross back and forth to see her mom, because being undocumented, she can't go to Mexico easily. And, you know, it's scarier for women, so she's not going to risk going and trying to come back and I just thought that was so powerful because we're imagining it like the law and the current situation and current events aren't stopping us from thinking big and so a door like a portal mm -hmm. just evades all the restrictions of citizenship and non-citizenship and all these things about the U.S. immigration that kind of keep you from being able to think big, you know, like the wait list is so long for people to try to get visas or citizenship. And so I just thought that was so powerful. And then another person I interviewed, Oscar, he was in touch with a lot of undocumented friends and he said that he would build an app that could scrub their records so they could mm -hmm. live a life here without um, the sort of incarceration records that people get that keep them from getting jobs or housing. So the powerful thing I thought about that is when we're imagining tech, however, you know, which I imagined, like when I imagined Silicon Valley, I feel like the sky is the limit for them, like no budget. They just get to kind of 
like rift and think about whatever they want to do and then they do it <laughs> and so I'm like what if we get to think that mm-hmm. big and when we get to think that big it's like you know, it's incarceration reform because we can wipe people's backgrounds clean or it's like immigration reform. So I think the power in imagining new technologies is like we're not limited by current realities of every day, Um, you know, like marginalization. So I do think that that's that's a really powerful way to start with with reform and with policy, which for me, like hopefully it came through in the book, you know, um, we do have to lead with policy because if I say like, I'm going to not use Amazon anymore, which is important for people that believe in divestiture, of course. But if I say I'm going to not use Amazon, like they are probably not shaking in their boots. And if I say Amazon needs antitrust and affirmative action, that people don't like that. <laughs> like They find it really <laughs> offensive. So I think like we start with policy because you can feel the anxiety um, from big tech companies around policy. Yeah. Well, just on this trend of thinking about the future, I was wondering about where your work's going from Data Borders and how are you developing? Are there any new projects that you're thinking about? Yeah, yes. I love that question. So I started in my head, I was calling it data borders responses. I had been interviewing people for years um, in my hometown about how they use technology, undocumented people. Um, And then when I was writing, I felt like I had to write data borders. I was able to sort of encapsulate those interviews and um, turn our attention towards tech. But the bigger picture for that was really like, how are undocumented people using technology? What do um, what are the critical? What do they think of technology? What are their theories on it or um, their beliefs about it? Um, what would they build again? So I see like what I'm doing now. I'm just going deeper into that, and I'm focusing specifically on undocumented Mexican women um, in Riverside County. So we're about an hour from the San Ysidro border. Um, and I'm thinking of it really in like scaling it back to theoretical foundations. So what do undocumented Mexican women believe about technology? What are their criticisms, um, you know, or dreams or, um, and their their lifelong experience of information technologies. So in library and information science, um, the sort of foundational theories are really like Western and based out of whiteness. So it's like technology good and technology solves Mm -hmm. people's problems. So I'm really trying to build from grounded theory, like what is an information science framework from Mexican undocumented women? Like what's their framework of technology? Um, And so far what I've gotten is like, it's, it can be good. It can be bad. You know, like they're really concerned about surveillance and data gathering, of course, and they're really concerned about their kids' overly interaction with tech in everyday lives. Mm -hmm. So trying to build sort of an information science, like perspective of technology out of those interviews, and then um, really their lifelong experiences with technologies. Uh, In the book, I talk about like storytelling and how um, these tech companies have sort of built themselves out of a storytelling framework where they are the hero, they're the borderline heroes, and um, the folks crossing are the bad guys, and anyone working with them or consuming their tech are the heroes. So I'm trying to look at these undocumented women as like, what is their story, their lifelong story, Mm -hmm. and especially with technologies. And in library and information science, there's there has been in the past like a sort of a deficit perspective towards Latinxes where it's like Latinxes don't have technology or ha- do not know how to like Latinxes in the U.S. like don't have enough technology or don't know how to negotiate information. And so I'm trying to sort of flip that by um, writing 
Mexican undocumented women's full lifelong experiences with technology and how it's sort of a borderlands project. So in Mexico, they were listening to the radio and answering, you know, talking to their loved ones who had already crossed over on the phones. And um, then when they cross over, they're calling their loved ones back <laughs> in Mexico <laughs> on the phones out here. They're having in the 90s having to buy really expensive calling cards and then their life changes with, um, I want to say Zoom, but it's not Skype. <laughs> and they're able to use Skype to talk to family members. So I'm really interested in that lifelong experience mm -hmm. that Mexican women have um, with technologies. And my sort of perspective is like their shaping of technologies, not necessarily how technologies have shaped them but how they have shaped technologies through their lives. So yeah, yeah that's kind of a long-winded response, but it, I do see it as a data borders um, response because again, it's like give information context. So instead of undocumented Mexican women being the point of like surveillance to capture, this hopefully flips the script, script and is based in their whole life story. Yeah. Wow. That sounds wonderful. I can't wait to read that. <laughs> yeah, I can't either because <laughs> I've been gathering data forever and I'm like, someday I'll have to write this, but yeah. <laughs> I have so much data. I'm just in the data of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The data of the data. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much for your time today, Melissa. And I hope everyone listening has a chance to read this fantastic book and keep an eye out for a new fantastic book coming out and hopefully digest some of our discussion today. But thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kaylin. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for having me.